Good morning, folks. Thank you all for deciding to spend some time with our history stories today. Uh, appreciate your joining our meeting. My name is Joe Long. I'm the education curator for South Carolina's oldest and finest military museum, the South Carolina Confederate Relic Room and Military Museum. And today we'll be returning to the sky for our history stories. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about South Carolina aviators in the First World War. And today, we're going to tell some stories about Second World War aviators in South Carolina and what happened to some of them afterwards. So thank you all very much for joining us. And I hope that today, as usual, uh, you'll maybe enjoy some history stories, get your interests peaked and then go out and do further reading and research and learn more. So, oh my goodness, I see that we have one participant with a bomber in the background. Pretty cool, Xavier. Um, so, welcome here and let us get underway. Uh, a lot of what I do today going to be drawn from several books, of course, and one of them that I commend to anyone who wants to really get into studying this campaign, Peter Hinchcliffe's The Other Battle about Bomber Command uh, and the German night fighters that opposed them in the Second World War. And this beauty, uh, this is not a combat story. Gilbert Gwynn's book, though, about the Arnold scheme gives the South Carolina connections to the background of that great campaign of the Second World War. So with that said, we're gonna talk about the Arnold scheme and the other battle. When we think of air campaigns of World War II, the first one that usually comes to mind is the Battle of Britain. And the Battle of Britain uh, would really be an epic and important air campaign. Uh, but today we're going to move beyond it in time uh, and look at a different strategy set as well uh, as we consider what happened afterwards. second folks having my usual fun with sharing stuff okay there we go now in the background of the big air battles of world war ii is a certain kind of thinking ever since the science fiction of the late 1800s there had arisen the idea that wars of the future, that modern wars would be fought by aircraft and that they would be decided by going past the armies, past the navies, simply going overhead and bombing enemy cities. And there were arguments both for and against this point of view, but many of the most forward thinking sort of the uh, folks that were following up on the lessons of World War I and looking toward the future, many of them got this Italian flying aces book, The Command of the Air. And this very important strategy book that military people were reading, it said, basically, because now you could move in three dimensions and reach enemy cities that were hundreds of miles away, without having to go through their armies to get there. That armies were outdated, that navies were outdated, that from now on, it was simply going to be dropping bombs on enemy cities that made all of the difference. And critical to Douay's thinking 
was the idea that the bomber will always get through. The idea was that because the air is so big, because the sky is so big and has so many directions, that basically it would be impossible to keep enough fighter planes in enough directions at enough different altitudes at all times of day and night to stop bombers that the bomber will always reach its target before the enemy can properly react. And so it was a weapon, according to Douay, against which there was no defense. And different air forces in the world bought into this idea, maybe less, maybe more. And within air forces, there were arguments Billy Mitchell in the American Army Air Corps was arguing for strategic air power and that other things, especially battleships, were outdated. Uh, oddly enough, the first major air force to try to use strategic bombing, uh, the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, didn't really buy into the idea. They didn't uh, for instance, design and buy big four-engine long-range bombers, as the Americans and the British had. Uh, they designed their air force primarily to assist the German army, while the British were building an air force that they believed could perhaps win a war all by itself. And this is all important background to our story. This theory of strategic bombing, you could argue that its roots in some ways were in South Carolina. General William Sherman famously said, war is cruelty and you cannot refine it. And as he went across South Carolina in 1865, as he had gone through Georgia in 1864, he caused destruction wherever he went, and he said that this was proper because it would hasten the end of the war. And the more of the Confederate population was out homeless, were made into refugees. They would be a burden on the Confederate government, and they would turn against that government. So why am I bringing up General Sherman, 1864 and 1865? when we're about to talk about World War II, because not just the air strategies and new things like Douay were being studied, but military history was being studied. And if you read what Sir Arthur Harris, the, the commander of the British Bomber Command in World War II, uh, is writing to say why civilian areas of Germany should be bombed, he echoes Sherman. He says, the more people are thrown out of their houses, the more people become refugees, the bigger burden they will be on the enemy government, and eventually they'll actually turn against their government. Something else that's going on and is also connected is the idea of um, uh, total war. Uh, Sherman's term for this was hard war. And we've mentioned it before in a history at home session. Uh, and one of the interesting things about history is how it connects. That's one reason that we do study it is to see those connections and see how ideas develop and persist over time. With the Industrial Revolution, there were military thinkers, and Sherman was one, who would say, well, it's not just a military against a military anymore. The factories are producing military items. And so a factory worker might as well be a soldier. A factory might as well be a fort. It's a target. By participating in the war effort, everything becomes a target and when a modern society mobilized for a modern war, everything was involved in the war effort. So that's the thinking behind bombing civilian areas. And the first 
uh, big time that this is going to happen is going to be what is called the Battle of Britain in 1940, when the Germans make an attempt to subdue the British Isles to, to make Great Britain amenable to capture uh, or to force them perhaps to surrender without landing troops by air bombardment of that country. Now the story is not quite that simple, but we don't have time to get into all the nuances of it today. What is definitely true though, is that Americans are paying attention. In 1940, we're not yet involved in World War II. Pearl Harbor is still a year and a half away when the Battle of Britain is at its height. But we're watching what's going on. And two things illustrated in these slides here, radar and communication. I see a couple more folks are joining us. That's great, we'll get full mobilization as we talk about full mobilization. Radar and communications have made it so that Douay's theory that the bomber can always get through is much more iffy. If you can tell hundreds of miles away that the bomber is coming, then you have time to prepare and get your fighter planes into position. And one way that that's gonna happen is they're going to put a lot of women's auxiliaries into the Royal Air Force. Uh, they need more personnel on the ground to help to keep track of, communicate with, and direct the planes in the air. And so you're gonna see civilians and women who join the Air Force and, and go into uniform uh, being a big part of the effort to protect their own country against bombing from the sky. And the Battle of Britain is famously and ultimately successful. The fighter pilots who are the tip of the spear flying their sleek Spitfire fighters. And by the way, didn't that fighter just have not only one of the prettiest designs, uh, a lot of folks have remarked on how attractive the Spitfire fighter plane was, but just the best name in aviation history, um, the Spitfire. And then if you pronounce it in German, it sounded ominous to you with a spit at the beginning of it. But these few pilots often referred to as the few because of Winston Churchill's speech about how they had saved Great Britain by their defeat over the course of many long weeks of intense combat of the German Air Force. He said, never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. Now, we saw in our World War I lesson a while back how the aces of World War I, the successful fighter pilots of World War I that shot down a lot of enemy aircraft became uh, national and international celebrities in World War I. And in World War II, the British fighter pilots who had saved uh, their island and struck against enemy bombers, bombing civilian areas, they became heroes too, not just at home, but overseas. Here in the United States, as people followed the news. Now, it wasn't necessarily about the issues always of the war. Uh, at the same time, in fact, the country of Finland was fighting ferociously to protect itself against the Soviet Union. And their defense of their own territory also was something Americans admired and sympathized with, even though Finland was a co-belligerent uh, during the war with Germany. But still, the picture of these heroic pilots defending their homeland against enemy bombers, that was something that inspired many Americans to sympathy and also inspired many young men in Britain. If they wanted to do one thing to help their country in this war, it was to become a pilot and preferably a Spitfire. One aspect of the air war 
that's going to be tell in every theater of war that there is, is that the hardest thing to do for these countries was not to produce airplanes in time to tip the balance of the air war, but to produce trained pilots. Pilot training took a particular kind of person to be selected in the first place, a lot of equipment, a lot of logistics, and a long time to make him into an effective pilot. And both Germany and Japan are going to start World War II with a big supply, apparently, of well-trained veteran pilots who have been in combat in smaller wars already. But both Germany and Japan are going to find they cannot replace these pilots at the rate that they're losing them. Because it's a very, very long process to train a pilot, much longer than it is to train a man to use a rifle and fight in the infantry. As the war is gearing up, the British have an additional problem, and that is Great Britain is a war zone. And you can't be having your pilot taking off in his little trainer to fly his first solo around the field and suddenly be jumped by a Messerschmitt. You can't train your pilots in the combat zone, and you can't dedicate the airfields that you need to fly your fighters and bombers from to training purposes. And so Great Britain decided to use different places in the empire to train its pilots and also cut a deal with a former part of the empire, and that, of course, is our own United States. Uh, Air Force General Hap Arnold here. You see him in his World War I flying uniform. Uh, and of course, a huge believer in air power and how important it could be. And you also see him there in his Second World War uniform. Well, Hap Arnold is going to strike a deal to train British pilots in the United States. Now, the United States is not part of the war yet. And this sure sounds like joining the British war effort. But there's a, a, a veil of deniability over it. Um, the training of British flight cadets is going to be carried out by civilian contractors in the United States, thinly veiled military instructors. Um, if you are familiar with the Flying Tigers, this is the same period of time when we are beginning to get ready to send pilots to defend China against the Japanese. But these American pilots who go over there are going to go as members of the Chinese Air Force and technically on the books, not even be members of our own Air Force. In the same way, Hap Arnold is going to come up with a scheme to train British pilots here in the United States for the Royal Air Force. And most of the bases chosen are going to be in the American South, including at Camden, South Carolina. Camden, South Carolina is going to be a hub of training for more than a year for Royal Air Force flight cadets. They got their basic military training somewhere else, but here in the United States is where they're going to learn to fly. And you see they're one of the training aircraft that they used. Some tremendous, tremendous stories come down to us. And, and again, this book, The Arnold Scheme, a hefty volume, as you can see. But one, if you get interested in this, you might want to check your local library for once it's open again. Uh, and some wonderful accounts of their arrival. Uh, one group that arrives in the South, reporters and a photographer from the local newspaper were there descending on the British cadet. Photographs were taken and articles written and preserved for posterity a picture of 53 Britons in formation wearing new ill-fitting Canadian issue khaki uniforms and Northwest Indian frontier sun helmets. So they're just sort of throwing things together. They've got cold weather uniforms. And if you've been in Camden, South Carolina in June or July, you don't want to be wearing a Canadian wool uh, cold weather uniform. But then 
that the British Imperial sun helmet on top of it, uh, and they felt and looked a little bit ridiculous, uh, but soon received a warm welcome wherever they went here in the South. Um, some of the descriptions here from Camden. Um, the Southern Aviation School was the designation of the place where they were going to be uh, training. For instructors and other school staff, working at the Camden School was a job, but also great fun. Aviators occupied a special place in the romantic view of the universe. The aviation helmet still looks pretty cool, doesn't it? Um, from the perspective of many people, there was as much satisfaction in the status accorded to flyers as in the flying itself. They were young, the job was pleasant. Although instructing could sometimes be a drag, it all constituted a great adventure. Perceptive student pilots who were assigned to the aviation school for flight training were primarily interested in flying, but most of them learned something of the town and its people. For many students, from different parts of the United States, and especially those from Britain, this was their first visit to the South. They were curious about the land and its people. Well, the land and its people were curious about them as well. The Camden Chronicle described what was going on at the Southern Aviation School. Um, and A couple of the men used the ridiculous uniforms they issued. Moore and Mycroft, two Royal Air Force corporals, uh, became a comedy team, often using articles of their uniforms to provide hours of entertainment with music hall routines. Um, the toupee, or the, another word apparently for the sun helmet, brought out the 14-year-old hidden away within most Royal Air Force students with a coin to screw into one eye as a monocle, a mustache, real or fake, and an exaggerated aspect, accent class comedians could have one or 50 people rolling with laughter. One of the trainees referred to the system that was used there in Camden. I remember the upperclassmen, American aviation cadets who were taller than most of us, well-disciplined. I liked the hazing system. Often do you hear that one? I liked the hazing system. We grumbled about it, but this was the done thing. It was well accepted and we in turn practiced it upon our lower classmen, though perhaps not with the same enthusiasm as our American upperclassmen did. Recreation was of a sporting nature, mostly swimming in Adams Pond and Hermitage Lake. Sometimes we were invited to share someone's boat for a ride on the lake. We took to softball, archery, and play pigeon shooting. I cannot ever remember having a date with a girl, nor can I remember other chaps dating girls. On Saturdays, the families I mentioned would take us for trips around town. Dances on Saturday evenings were usually organized affairs with daughters well chaperoned. We were made to feel very welcome and, and we sincerely appreciated their efforts. Well, yes, well chaperoned, but there's an appendix to this book listing several dozen marriages that resulted between American girls and Royal Air Force flying cadets being trained in Camden, South Carolina. They viewed the aircraft they trained on very favorably indeed. Trainers were usually built to be easy to fly and pleasant. My flying instructor, one man wrote, was a civilian by the name of Harry Houghton. We got on fine right from the start. Harry Houghton was one of the best, and after 10 hours of teaching me every trick in flying the Stearman PT-17, we took off one morning and headed for the auxiliary field north of Camden, which we had often used for circuits and bumps. That's takeoff and landing practice, circuits and bumps. Harry told me to taxi to a corner as he wanted to smoke. He got out and turned to me saying, it's all yours. What a strange feeling taking off alone on your first solo twice around the field. 
and in for the first solo landing. Must have been a good one. Harry said, go around again. I haven't finished my cigarette yet. Our stay at Camden was made much happier by the hospitable families which adopted us for the duration of our stay. After 10 weeks at Camden, the last function I remember was a dinner dance at the Sarsfield Club. Next morning, we carted our kit down the drive to the Red Gulf service station where a Greyhound coach waited. Well, these young men having their adventures, experiencing a new culture, uh, one of them wrote about a unique feature of the American South in the 1940s. They got a briefing from the Royal Air Force that said, uh, make sure not to offend our American hosts uh, so it don't talk to any of the black people who might work at the airfield because they have strange customs about how they treat those people and we just don't want to get into it. And one of the Royal Air Force cadets wrote, of course, we immediately all made up our minds to violate that rule and many developed lifelong friendships by doing so. Interestingly, the people put in charge of um, entertaining the cadets and making them feel welcome were often not the folks you'd think. In fact, the daughters of the American Revolution, who of course celebrated their ancestors fighting the British, became one of the primary groups to uh, put on parties and make the Royal Air Force cadets feel welcome. And here we have that P.T. Stearman. Apparently these planes were just a joy to fly, according to those who did fly them. And some of the bases where the U.S. Army Air Force uh, was training. And you see here Greenwood and Camden uh, in South Carolina, uh, bases in Florida, Alabama, and Georgia. And during the time when the training scheme is really getting underway is when the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor. And these men go from simply being guests to openly being allies fighting on the same side against the same enemies. Beautiful picture here of uh, more advanced trainers. You see American insignia on the wings of the trainers, and yet the cadets are spelling out the name of their own service. Uh, they are members, of course, of the, of the Royal Air Force. One difference between the American point of view and the British point of view on flying, by the way, in the American services, pilot was always an officer job. Uh, there was one Navy squadron called the Flying Chiefs that had the distinction of being flown by chief petty officers. But in general, the American point of view was the man in the cockpit uh, using the controls of the aircraft would always be a commissioned officer. Not so in the Royal Air Force. Uh, flying cadets could be enlisted men, pilots could be sergeant pilots. There were seven-man bomber crews that included no officers aboard the crew whatsoever. And not only were they often lower ranking than American aviation cadets, but even if they were the same rank, Royal Air Force cadets were paid very poorly indeed compared with their American counterparts. And it was a dangerous job. You couldn't, you didn't just risk your life when you went into combat in the air service. Aviation was always dangerous. And there were cadets who died in training in the United States. This is an excerpt I'm reading from the Camden Chronicle. Uh, on the 31st of October, on Halloween of 1941, uh, the rector of Camden's Grace Episcopal Church is conducting a burial service for a cadet. And most of the cadets that came were members of the Church of England. So Grace Episcopal Church in downtown Camden became uh, their church during the period that they were in the United States. The Camden Chronicle relates, the British lad of Ashford, Kent, will rest in ground hallowed by the dust of American heroes of the revolution, the war between the states, 
and the last world war. A guard of honor of 20 British cadets will accompany the body to its final resting place. A squad of American soldiers from Battery E, 1st Army, will fire a salute over the grave while the field artillery band from the public relations headquarters of the 1st Army will play the dirge. The rites of the grave will be closed with the sounding of taps by a bugler from the 1st Army. Overhead, a formation of five planes with the sixth, that of the dead cadet missing, will fly over. The entire personnel of the Southern Aviation School, including the officers, clerical staff, instructors, mechanics, and cadets will attend the funeral services. The death of Cadet Pritchard cast a deep gloom over the school personnel and extended throughout the community. The British cadets, by their fine personality and gentlemanly qualities, their intense devotion to their country and gracious acceptance of American ideas, have won the deep respect, admiration, and affection of all Camden people. News of Cadet Pritchard's death Thursday cast a pall of gloom over the city. Now, all these cadets joined with the idea of assisting their nation's war effort against Germany, and most of them with the idea that they were going to be Spitfire pilots, flying high-speed pursuit aircraft to knock down German airplanes and hasten the end of the war. The air campaign had changed, and most of them are not going to be assigned to Spitfires. Instead, they're going to be assigned to fly the big bombers, the Lancasters and the Halifaxes of the Royal Air Force's Bomber Command. These large lumbering aircraft are going to pen penetrate hundreds of miles over German airspace in the dead of night, navigation being just one more danger for them to undergo. Uh, and when they get there, they're going to drop bombs on German cities. Now, they're creating pilots at these flight schools. And the pilot, of course, uh, is one member of a seven-man crew. But there was another man aboard who might very well have gone through at least part of one of the schools here, uh, like the one in Camden, and that was the navigator. You see, a lot of pilots don't complete flight training. At some point, uh, they're, they're found that they just can't be trusted with an aircraft, and the decision is made, this guy's never gonna make a pilot, uh, and it's called washing out. A Camden student who did wash out published a poem in uh, the class magazine of another air school. And in this poem, the young pilot candidate lamented his situation. Uh, Grant titled the verse, To the Departed. Unhappy we, in lack a day, sackcloth and ashes scatter, an ode I give you here to us, whose dreams are all a shatter. 4,000 miles to fail a course is surely fate most bitter. It is enough to shake and shock or paralyze a critter. Relax, nose down, coordinate. Use rudder when you turn. Keep looking round. Fly with the T. Oh, will you never learn? We thank the noble band of men, our ever patient tutors, who truly work like men possessed to aviate our futures. We tried our best to make the grade, but it was not to be. And now we've gone to learn to guide you home from Germany. And so cheer ho to all you blokes. We'll meet soon, never fear. And yours will be the privilege of paying for the beer. What he's referring to is that failed pilot candidates were sent to a school in Canada where they became navigators and would join the guys graduating from flight school in Camden uh, to be assigned aboard the same bombers. Uh, so wonderful little poem. Thank you for indulging me and in listening to it. The flyers who graduated from the Southern training schools in the Arnold scheme are going to 
head overseas, rejoin the Royal Air Force, and continue their wartime aviation careers. You see here, out of almost 8,000 cadets, there were only 4,500 graduates. So you've got more than half graduating as pilots, but many of the others being sent to become navigators. Uh, most of these men are going to become sergeant pilots. They're not going to become officers as American flying candidates did. And when they get overseas, they're going to find themselves part of the Royal Air Force's campaign to bomb Germany into submission. That campaign is going to take a terrible, terrible toll on the young airmen assigned. Every 100 airmen heading over, uh, heading into that campaign, every 100 of them, 55, more than half, will be killed on operations or die of wounds. Three will be injured on operations or active service. So you had a far higher chance of being killed than of merely being injured. 12, or more than 10%, are going to be taken prisoner of war and become POWs in Germany. Two out of every hundred will be shot down, but evade capture. And the underground will somehow get in contact with them and spirit them away, and they will actually be returned to allied territory um, after having been shot down. Out of a hundred airmen, only 27 would survive a tour of operations. Early in the war, that was 30 missions. They later cut it down to 25 missions. But they took about 5% um, losses uh, on missions in 1942. So every man who could do math would say, yeah, I've got a 5% chance of not coming back from each mission, but I'm supposed to do 30 missions. So that stacked the odds heavily, heavily against you're making it through as a bomber crewman. One of the things that contributed to this was the design of British bombers and the full German mobilization of the defenses. Just like the English had been doing, the Germans now begin to rely heavily on uh, female auxiliaries and air signals personnel on the ground. Uh, it was calculated it took about 150 ground personnel to keep a German night fighter going. Now, why is it a night fighter? Well, the British had bought into the idea that the bomber always gets through, and so the design of their aircraft, unlike the American Flying Fortress, uh, these aircraft were not heavily armed and they were not armed in every direction. Instead, the big British bombers, uh, they, they do have four guns aft here with a gunner. There's a gunner up here. There's some weapons facing forward. But compared to the B-17, which had waste gunners pointing in both directions here, as well as a turret firing underneath, they're fairly poorly protected. And in fact, the British learned early in the war that if they sent their bombers over in daylight, they would take terrible losses, that the German fighters were knocking them down with relative ease. The answer was to fly at night. And the belief was that you know at least at night, the bomber will always get through if it can find its target. Well, Germany fully mobilizes and uses radar and other weapons and organization on the ground uh, and specialized night fighting aircraft. The best one being the BF-110, perhaps. Um, the 110, this aircraft from a identification card here, and uh, you would study this kind of card to learn the silhouettes of aircraft so you could identify them quickly. Well, the Messerschmitt 110 had been a failure as a fighter plane by day. 
just as the British bombers had proven that they weren't very effective, uh, couldn't defend themselves by day, uh, the Messerschmitt 110, or uh, the BF 110, during the Battle of Britain, uh, showed that it simply was no match for Spitfires and Hurricanes. Uh, so what would they do with this aircraft? Well, it was because it had multiple crew members and they could put extra equipment on it, like eventually airborne radar, it was pretty well adapted to being a night fighter. Well, the British bombers, here's an early, earlier model British bomber, the Wellington, British bombers that couldn't bomb effectively by day were also consigned to night battles, and now there was a rematch. In the rematch, the British, uh, the, the German night fighters proved to be very effective, but so did the bombers in delivering thousands of pounds of high explosive on targets in Germany. By night, you couldn't aim precisely. In fact, the Americans with their better armed bombers became the daylight bombers, aiming for specific military targets, factories and so forth. Um, the British night bombers without the ability to aim for a specific target were instead dumping their loads of explosive onto cities in general. And as I mentioned, General Sherman's uh, thought that to destroy housing and create refugees would put a strain on the government and eventually turn the people against the government was part of their thinking, especially at first. Here we see the Messerschmitt 109 with this big radar apparatus in front as night fighting becomes more sophisticated. And the inside of one of these things, eventually with actually three crew members, you had the pilot, you had the rear gunner, and you also had the fellow in the middle doing the electronics, including the radar. Sir Arthur Harris, Bomber Harris, is a very controversial figure in World War II. Uh, it, perhaps his most famous quote is this biblical illusion about reaping the whirlwind. The Nazis entered this war under the rather childish delusion that they were going to bomb everyone else and nobody was going to bomb them. At Rotterdam, London, Warsaw, and half a hundred other places, they put their rather naive theory into operation. They sowed the wind, and now they're going to reap the whirlwind. And you see Harris here, who was very much a hero to his crews, uh, honored on a British postage stamp. One of the people who's not going to get along with Bomber Harris is General Eisenhower, when he becomes the overall Allied commander for the attack into France and against Germany. Bomber Harris is certain that the way to win the war is just as Douay said in his theories, that bombing enemy cities is the key to victory, uh, that in fact, the heavy bombers, given the chance and full resources, the heavy bombers can win the war all by themselves. Oddly enough, his boss, Winston Churchill, had actually written a paper in the 1920s about how this theory was not correct. But in the 1940s, he bet the British war effort on the bomber offensive, partly because he had no real other choice of a way to strike at the German homeland. Uh, they weren't ready to launch an invasion. The Soviets were fighting furiously on the Eastern Front, and Britain determined to strike with the bombing of cities. And Harris really believed this was the way to win the war. So when Eisenhower was put in command of the D-Day operation and the advance across Europe after D-Day, he was told as soon as the troops land, all air assets belong to you. You tell Bomber Command what to do and they will do it. And Eisenhower said, perfect, great. 
Bomber Command, your job is to strike military targets to assist the advancing troops. Arthur Harris said, yes, sir, and continued to do what he was already doing, which was carry on his bomber offensive by night against German cities. Uh, he simply ignored the fact that he was now supposed to answer to this American general and put his priorities where Eisenhower wanted the priorities. Leadership is never simple. So what about this idea that wiping out the German cities would destroy the will of the population to fight and end the war? Did that happen? This remains an argument in military history, and I encourage you to read about it and come to a conclusion on it. But I'm gonna say this, the British had been thoroughly bombed in the Battle of Britain, and it had hardened their resolve to fight harder. The massive, massive attacks on German cities wound up causing an incredible amount of destruction. They did not cut German war production. At the end of the war, Germany was still producing more tanks and artillery pieces than they had men to man those things. Now, American daylight bombing caused a real crisis in the German oil supply. They were experiencing shortages of oil that were often crippling to their military operations. But production, production had not really fallen. And the number of civilian casualties of the bombing campaign was enormous, as was the loss to the bomber crews who were carrying out the campaign. So when we think of these guys, these young, bright, carefully selected men who traveled across the ocean, uh, in order to take their flying training to serve their nation in wartime in World War II. And remember those statistics I gave you, that if you looked at this group, more than half of them would be killed in the bomber offensive. And of the others, 10% are going to end up prisoners of war. It's a tremendous sacrifice that they're going to make. And the man making strategic decisions always has to remember that others are investing their lives in his judgment. And it's well worthwhile our studying those campaigns in World War II for what we can learn from them and whose theories of war uh, were more accurate and whose were less. But to end on a bit more of a, on a different note, we see here a group of German night fighters, experten, they were called, those who got high scores of bombers brought down. Uh, and these men who wrote down their stories afterwards, the few who survived, uh, often insisted that they never tried to harm the crew of a bomber, uh, that they attempted to bring down the machine and hope the men got out in their parachutes. Um, this was a very low percentage sort of thing. And if they thought about it, they probably understood that wasn't very likely. However, at reunions after the war, uh, there was a great deal of forgiveness and fellow spirit shown among former airmen who fought on both sides and understood that they had fought in some of the same ways and lost friends in the same ways. And after the war, many of them would continue in aviation careers. And so one very positive side effect of having a huge campaign that happened mostly at night in the Royal Air Force's bomber offensive against Germany was a lot of advances in flight control, in communications, and in radar, and in ground control lessons that are used to this day to give us safe and reliable airline flights. And many of the same personnel who were engaged in that campaign of destruction on both sides went very happily and with great relief into civilian flying after the war 
and helped to give us reliable air transport today. So, as I sometimes do, I've hopped about on different subjects today and different stories. There are so many you can read about this campaign. Again, the Arnold scheme, the other battle by Peter Hinchcliffe. Enemy in the Dark by Peter Spoden uh, is actually a book by a German night fighter pilot. Uh, and there are on Amazon Kindle a number of inexpensive memoirs, including Night Fighter Navigator, uh, which is won by a British night fighter uh, who was part of that campaign as well. So thank you all for joining me today. I hope I made you a little more curious about this really interesting aircraft campaign in World War II and about folks who maybe visited your own town and trained very near places that you travel to every day or worshiped at the same church you may worship at on Sunday uh, more than half a century ago in the Second World War. Um, anybody have any questions at this point? Yes. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. I sure appreciate y'all turning out today uh, to get a little history in. Uh, I'm going to give one more unsolicited endorsement. And um, that is uh, perhaps at your library or elsewhere. There was an interesting quasi documentary done, I think, by the BBC a few years ago. It's called Bomber Boys. And in that sort of reality TV series, what they did was get seven descendants of Bomber Command members in World War II, uh, seven kids in their late teens and early 20s, and train them Royal Air Force style from the 1940s to fly a Lancaster bomber. Uh, and the series is full of interviews with original Bomber Command crews, uh, and they're talking about what they went through. 